Sass department. Yeah. Yeah, like John Taylor, Bullshit, Gunther, all the sure it's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And the book, it's so good. Mm -hmm. It's your favorite. My yeah. professor? Yeah. No, okay. Every, every, month. <laughs> every professor. Every professor. Last year's stats? Yeah. Last yeah. one. Yeah. Taylor's major. Yeah. Jesus. Well, I have a professor of 315 years ago, so look. I think he's going to have like 300 months all the other. No. For 315 B? Yeah. We already got my work. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're saying you have to reassign? No, I just remember when I took it, it was like, okay, no homework. So all of a sudden, he like remembered, oh, I need to give homework. Should I He's go? Like, give this course. People are still drifting out. Yeah, it's like. He's been in for about five. He's been back. He, yeah, he's been in for about five. He's been Hi, I have, a, I have a question for the audience here. How many people were able to download and run H2O? One, two, three, four, half, maybe, sort of, kind of. Okay, it's going to be a requirement here before long. How many people here have been playing with R? Feel kind of comfortable a lot. I mean, how many people? Python. Oh, fair amount as well. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to wait another minute or two. Let smoke can drift in, and then we'll take off. data size and we'll talk about a bunch of other issues uh, today um, while looking at some data here. So, so just for an easy opener here, um, there's a couple different ways to think about data sets and they change how you want to operate on them. So the, the obvious one this course is about is the small versus big question and the, the interesting, see, I have this here, the interesting notion here is that is it you know small enough that it goes on my laptop or not or it fits on a flash stick or not? So today I'm going to mess around with the data sets a little over two gigabytes in size. It takes about five minutes to copy it on a flash stick. And, and the basic notion here is that the basic operations are just slow. And they're becoming painfully slow. So I wanted a data set that was a thousand times bigger, like, like it's too painful to use a flash stick anymore. I have to have some other technology to move it around, right? It, it, gets, it gets annoying. Um, also, many of the tools start to fall apart at some point of scale, and people have been reaching for downsampling for decades as a technique which works well on some data sets where there's a lot of repetition in the data and there's not so much, the signals are easy and obvious to pull out, but for many long tail distributions and anything to do with uh, un unlikely events, so credit card fraud or finding cancer or, or predicting equipment failure, all are sort of long tail events for which you, you have a thousand times more positive results than a negative result. And if you downsample, you start losing, you know, crucial information leading up to finding the signal. So, so there's a there's a reason to want to have big data, but it becomes painful when it gets too big. Sparse versus dense. Um, there's a couple domains where people do sparse data a lot. 
Sometimes sparse means uh, the default value is zero and it's not represented. And there are uh, SDM Lite is a different data format for this kind of data. Um, text analytics and health data often look like this. Um, and the sparseness has an interesting number, which is the fill rate, the non-zero, the non-missing value rate. And it's, it's common to have 1,000 to 1 or even a million to one fill rates. So, so a million zeros for every non-zero. And then you really want a different entire data structure and a different entire algorithm and how you deal with data sets of that kind. And then tall and skinny versus short and fat. Again, it depends on the domain you're in. Um, today we're gonna look at a tall, a classic tall and skinny data set again. It's what HTO is really geared for. But uh, <laughs> often in a say healthcare data set, you'll have um, you know, 30,000 predictors on an individual human, but only you know, a couple hundred thousand humans in the in the study you're doing. And, and maybe you've got text analytics and you have uh, 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 in tuples of words and you have a few million combinations of word tuples you're gonna look for as prediction things. Most documents don't have them, so it's very sparse. But maybe you only got you know, a thousand documents long, but you've got millions uh, or billions possibly of features going out. And again, the data set's very sparse, so it's not necessarily so big, but if you wanna do math on it and your math is doing something different by the width versus the height, then, then it matters what the data set looks like. So obviously next time I wait till 10 minutes after. Oh, the clock is a little fast. So the clock is a little fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it actually, oh, look at that, it is. Okay, fine. We should fix the clock here. Okay, so um, uh, one of the issues we'll look at today is time to solution. Running time matters. Constant factors on your algorithms to build solutions matter. Um, if your data is small, you know, any tool works. Go sit down with R or Python, whatever your favorite development environment is, on your laptop and go to town. Um, but if your data gets bigger, it starts to make a difference what tool chain you use and how and why. So if you have high end for rows and high P for features, um, algorithms start to fail in different ways. You can blow out time or memory. I mean, you end up doing some sort of compromise just to get something done on a larger data set. You know, one of the compromises you downsample. Another compromise is you do stratified sampling, some more intelligent sampling in some domains, or you don't get to use your favorite algorithm, which looks, you know, P squared or P cubed or something. So here's generalized linear modeling. This is the runtime of the implementation that's in H2O for the default GLM. The constant factor is uh, one clock cycle for a flop um, for in rows divided by the number of CPUs you're running in parallel, and it parallelizes very nicely. So n can be billions and trillions, sort of readily. You put a thousand CPUs on a trillion rows, and it's a billion flops. Well, a billion flops is one second on an x86, so hey, that's okay. But it's also feature squared plus a p cubed, and that p cubed number blows out pretty fast. So at 100 features, I don't care. It's too fast. You know, a thousand takes about a second, okay. I mean, five iterations, add a second for each one, five seconds, fine, whatever. At 10,000, it's a couple minutes a pop. I need five iterations to a solution, it's an hour. This one's years, right? So, so there's, a, there's a clear foul off the cliff where the column, the, the data set gets wider and you just can't use this technology anymore. It just doesn't work, right? So you'll have to pick and choose, looking at your data set, what kind of solving technique you end up using. And the different ones will have different running time factors according to um, you know, how the implementation goes. So uh, a quick recap, and then I'll, I'll pull out a much bigger data set and we'll go again. Um, I'm going to load data. I'm going to have, I know it's going to load correctly this time because I messed with it already, um, but I'm going to inspect it some um, to take a look at it. I'm going to build a model. My model is going to be, you know, look good actually, but will look bad after a minute. Um, and then I'm going to go add a bunch of new features and repeat until my model gets good enough as sort of the basic workflow and how this stuff kind of goes. In this case, it's city bikes. Let me, um, actually, if, are people interested in doing this as for team now and next week? Here is a two gigabyte data set, takes five minutes to copy. If someone's interested, I'm gonna pass it around. You can copy it to your desktop. And then if you get a chance, you can go again. If you're not interested, don't copy. So I definitely have some people interested. Can you can take it and copy if you want, and not if you don't. All right, so it's, um, you know, rent a bike in New York City and ride your way around town. There are 340 stations. Here's a map of where the stations are located. Um, you pay by the hour, by the day, or have an annual monthly fee kind of operation. Um, bikes get shuffled every day. And at the start of a day, you know, you want to know there's bikes there because if you're at the end of, a, 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 of an inbound subway train and you pile off the subway, people are going to grab bikes and go. So those bike racks need to be full. And at the end of the day, they're probably scattered all over and they'll need to be regathered. At least that's sort of the theory. It's not an actual problem, but it makes for a great data science thing. 10 million rides, a couple gigabytes of data. 
So I'm going to do a demo. Um, I'm, I'm going to show off Python uh, and Flow at the same time, go back and forth. We'll do a little size check on the data. We'll launch the IDE and, and we'll load and do some summary stuff and come back around and it'll <laughs> get more interesting as we get into it here. So I'm going to um, launch a JVM here. I'm going to demand that it's a minimum size, four gigs, because um, I know my data set's at least two. It probably wouldn't hurt if I was bigger there. That's, no more or less real. That's not the important one to read here. Um, the key. The can't see it all. What's in front? Can you turn the lights? Okay. This window will be less interesting. Let, let's let's press on for a second, and we'll go, we'll try something. We'll check it out. Here, something else here. Hang on. Are you running it locally? So this is running on my laptop. Right. I ran a four gigabyte JVM on my laptop right now. I'm good for like up to like 10 gigs on my laptop as the JVM for which I probably need a data set that's no bigger than half my heap reasonably, maybe a third to half my heap before you start to have GC issues. Okay, I have, a, I have a Python script that I've messed with for a while. This particular Python script, the first little stanza there is simply, the, the only line of interest is import H2O. I'm going to change my working environment where I can find H2O and import it into Python. So, um, If I can find my keys again. So different people will have different Python environments. I, I, um, but this is a standard classic command line. Is this now readable? Yeah, people more like, OK. I don't hear anybody complaining in the back. OK, so I just launched an H2O init command, which reached out to find the JVM that I already launched. And it says something like, I got 3.4 gigabytes free after the JVM takes its own. There are four cores. It's my laptop. It's been up for a little while. There's the, the IP address and stuff. So this is like a sanity check. I found the JVM I launched. I could launch one in the init call. Sometimes I do it that way. It's convenient. Sometimes I do it the way I did with separate windows. So I can go back and forth between windows. If we go back and forth in this class, I'll have to mess with the contrast. But we'll, we'll figure something out there. Um, I'm going to load my data. And so here I'm listing files as a Python array object. And then I'm going to do an import file. OK, and while that's going on, OK, something's happening. I have to have to, uh, hello, Windows. Yeah, so I've slammed my little lappy here. Yeah, it's coming around, maybe. Oh, something happened. Okay, so so this is the difference between you know a thousand rows of Titanic and ten million rows. Um, it got busy for a while. Okay, something happened. It came back, and I have a few warnings. I'm going to ignore because it doesn't look like it lost too much stuff. And I'll do a, a quick summary of the data. And oh my gosh, what happened here? It scrolled wide, wide or wide. So if I scroll up, and eventually I can find some title lines and a whole lot of columns listed and some more stuff. And it doesn't work at this format. And that's actually very common. And so I didn't expect it to work when I did this. But this is sort of, you know, you're in a, a text mode operation. You have these kinds of issues versus a GUI. But I can see a bunch of columns. There's a trip duration. How long did the bike ride go? There's a start time, a stop time, station ID, a station name. Longitude, latitude, and the end station. Okay, the bike went from here to there. Um, there's bike IDs, user types, birth year, gender, and some stuff. Okay, so there's some information here about bike rides, and I'm going to try to figure out something I can do with that. Um, but it's awfully like hard to read in that giant format. So let's just do one column at a time here. Okay, here's trip duration. So what I'm really doing at this point is I'm sanity checking that I loaded data, right? That I didn't get crap in. So I see. Minimums are 60 and maxes of like 6 million and a mean of 870. So, so what does these numbers mean? Right, so that's an open question and that's very common. You get a data set, what are the units? What are the metrics? What's actually going on? This is data provenance. What the hell you got? I'm going to guess that the, the number here are seconds, that there's a minimum of a minute a pop. They only, they, and it, they're counting in seconds, but they're probably rounding to the nearest minute. My minimum trip time is one minute because somebody pulled a bike out, changed their mind, put it back. And they got billed for a minute. Somebody's got six million because they took their bike home and didn't bother to return it. And after a while, you know, New York City will hunt them down and demand they pay for a bike. I guess, I don't know. Average trip is 870 seconds. It's 
close to like 15 minutes, which kind of makes sense. I grabbed the bike off a subway, I went to Starbucks, I grabbed something, I went somewhere else, grabbed something, I threw the bike by office, on my office building and I walked into my building. So I'm just kind of sanity checking that I believe what I'm looking at. And then you know, here's some numbers from some typical bike trips in terms of seconds. Hey, that looks fine. Um, let me look at another one here. Here's a different column. Start station name. I have a bunch of names here. East 47th and 2nd, West 26th and 10th, Lafayette and East 8th. It looks like intersections where you put a bike rack. So, so I'm kind of thinking, okay, I got something about start station name. I can also see that my max is 339, min zero. I have 340 different unique strings in that data set, and that's the 340 unique uh, places where they put bikes. So I'm going to start or stop at one of these 340 different stations um, you know, going down the road. So let's go, let's see here, bam. Okay, so that was that. So, so things to, to figure out here. 10 million rows is too big to look and think all of it is like sensible. You have to just do summaries. So I grabbed the quick summaries, the min, the max, the mean values, to decide that I was looking at something reasonable, right? If I looked at trip duration and, and paid attention, I'd seen there was a giant sigma uh, 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 on that. So the mean, the sigma here is 3,000, that's like an hour. It says that the standard deviation is about an hour, or three quarters of an hour. On the average trip is 15 minutes. It says you have a pretty wide spectrum. Some of these people are taking bikes out all day, and maybe that's correct. They grabbed it from the subway, they took it to the office, they parked it in their office all day, they rode it back to the subway on the way home, and the bike was checked out for eight hours. I don't know, something like that. Um, the start time field, is in milliseconds since the Unix Epic, and that's a standard H2O way to represent time internally. Let me go look at that again here so people can see what that looks like. It's a, it's a thing that you can eyeball straight off. Okay, let's just do it this way here. Um, it's 1.3 billion milliseconds since 1970, right? Plus or minus jump change, which doesn't show in a rounded off floating point display. So, so those kinds of numbers are a red flag that this field got parsed as time, but there's a type on the file in the column that says time. So this is a time parse. That only happens for certain kinds of file formats. We'll talk a bunch more about looking at time later as we go on today, because that happens just all the time. Um, collinearity, um, here I don't mean it in the classical mathematical sense, so that, that also applies, but it's simply that there's no net new info to let me predict things between station ID, station name, longitude, latitude. These are all values which are essentially unique on that station. So I might be able to get something cool out of longitude and latitude between stations to say there's a distance, um, but I'm trying to predict bike starts uh, all, over all time so that a, a rebalancing crew might have a clue on this day, go to this station, grab 50 bikes from it, and go dump, dump those this other station. And, you know, some mapping some managers trying to do about moving people around, moving bikes around. Um, and then I don't necessarily need all these other columns. They're not helping me. And there's a cost to keep them and a cost to do math on them if they're collinear. They're not helping, and they don't necessarily make a better prediction. And I'm going to drop a bunch of them, and that'll simplify my data set a lot. And that's also very common. Yeah, go for it. Do you just look for the covariance and see which ones are really you, co correlated? You can do that, although at this stage, so, so that works when you've got 50 columns. And it doesn't work when you have 5,000. So, so it's more common that you attempt to find the obvious ones and throw them out yourself, and then you let the tools pick it out afterwards, but you'll pay the price of keeping the columns around. I'm gonna ditch a bunch today to make it easier to demo and show people what's going on, but the same notion exists. So there's one other interesting uh, negative uh, reason to keep them around, and that is the, uh, the reason that a model predicts, the variable importances that come out, will end up getting shared amongst the covariant columns. And so they'll all sound like they're all weakly predictive, but if you throw out all of them, all the three out of the four, the fourth will suddenly become very strongly predictive, for instance, right? Okay, so commonly you'll think, say things like day of the year, and month, and week of the year, and these are all basically collinear, although they have more or less resolution. But if you're looking for seasonal data, do I want to buy you know, fur coats or swimsuits? then you know, months probably just as good as you know, week of the year, right? And so having all of them probably doesn't help, you can probably throw out the extras. Okay, the next thing is I got bike trips here, 10 million trips, but I'm looking trips per station per day. So I don't have the right data yet. I'm gonna do a group buys, it's called. 
grouping by start station and the day. And within that grouping, I'll count the trips. So in the bottom, my little demo of East 39th and 2nd, um, you know, I have three trips at the same station, same day. I'm going to pull out a count of three rides. And, and maybe I want some other stuff. So by merging the trips together, I'm going to lose some data, but I'm going to get a chance to get the information I want. So I'm going to lose the unique rider per day, the unique riders on each individual ride. Uh, I'll lose uh, maybe the destination where they're headed to either. But maybe I can keep some stuff like the average age of the rider, maybe that helps, maybe the gender, uh, user type, which is whether they are um, you know, a daily, uh, uh, they're paying by the minute or they're paying you know, by the month, where they've prepaid and they don't care how long you can bike out, stuff like that. So I'm going to do a, a, a big group by in there. And so, so the basic first sponging, oh, I didn't look at gender. We should look at gender here real quick. Let me, let me go back and talk you through gender. Come back, find the keyboard again, thank you. So here I'm going to look at column by name. I can see there's a minimum value in the gender of zero and a max of two. And it's an integer column, so it's zero, one, and two. So it's what, male, female, and Martian? Right, because like something's going on here, right? What, is, what are the three values? So then if I look at the mean of one, and I look at the count of zeros, which is handily give me, there's 1.2 million. So I got 10 million rides, 1.2 million are zeros. What do I think zero means? Unknown. Yeah, it's unknown, yeah, that's my guess. Somebody didn't bother to tell me what, what <laughs> sex they were, fine. Um, so I'm gonna throw the zeros out and declare them a missing value. So I don't know what that gender is. And then I'll have between one and two, but I won't know whether one or two is male or female. That's just part of the game there. Okay, so I'm gonna replace the, the zeros with none, and this is some Python hacking, and this is one of the reasons to do the data munging in, in either R or Python here. You can write sort of arbitrary algebraic expressions here I'm calling out a column by name. Here's a big 2D table. This is one column of it. This gives me a Boolean vector of true or false according to whether your value is zero or not. Then I have another instance of data, again, picking a column by name. Here I have a selector, which is a Boolean column, and it's going to take the true and the false to decide to do something or not on every row of all 10 million. And the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a none value, say missing, over the zeros. So this is a shorthand notation that says over 10 million rows, in parallel, distribute across your cluster, go assign missing over zero. Then I'll do the group by, as expected, compute some averages, and then I'll attempt my first model build and see what happens. Ta da! Okay, that's the summary already. Let's go do demo time here. Uh, okay, I'm going to drop all the extra columns by name um so i can like read it here oh gosh it even fits on my slide look at that pretty close so start time start station user time birth name okay that looked good do the gender hack there it is okay it went done gender kind of kind of the window i can kind of see it off the right here now i have nans instead of zeros and my average changed from 1.08 to 1.2 so it says, I have a high dominance, it's mostly men or mostly women, I don't know which one, and you know, a little 20%-ish on the other side. Okay, now I'm gonna convert the, the time I have to days since the epoch, because I'm gonna do group by on the days. And I'm gonna do it by taking the start time column, divided by second day, and the floor. This is another across all 10 million rows operation here. And done, and it came out, and it now has wrapped. And you can see 15887 going down the side. That's the day number since 1970 for the first 10 rows. Turns out my data set's sorted by time. So the first 1,000, 10,000 trips are from the first day. So 15887 repeats 10,000 times in a row or something like that. And then it'll go 15887 and so on. So it works its way through. But I'll do a group by. I'm going to not talk too much about the syntax, um, mostly because what it means is Look it up in the docs. So, okay, there it was. It's done. And now something changed. I have 15887 as the day number. Here's the other date, the station. That's the other grouping thing. First Avenue, East 15th. Then First Avenue, East 18th, and so on. Because I can't quite make the column wide enough without shrinking the font. What you can't see is there's a mean trip duration and mean birth year and in rows of the trips. So let's go look down a little bit here. And what, yeah, that's a little better. So. If you left from East 15th, you took an average trip of 700 seconds. If you went from East 18th, it was a little longer, it was like 15 minutes and change. Your age is a little younger. 
Then on the other station, there were 40 trips on that day and 47 from the other one and so on and so forth. I'm going to rename a column because I don't like in-road trip duration to just bikes and get a dimension count. I still can't shrink the column enough, huh? Uh, I'll have to do one more shrinkage. And, and then this is a dimensional count. That's 140,000 roughly rows. So that's a combination of, of 340 stations by 400 and change days that the data set's spanning over. Um, I'm going to do a little model. So I'm driving it from Python. I'm going to pick the names from the data set is what I'm going to use the columns to do prediction on. Taking bikes out of those names, because that's what I want to uh, predict as my result. Give it a list of predictors, get the, the response column I'm trying to predict. The data set I'm going to do the prediction on, and so on, and I'll go build myself a model. And it's going to take a little longer than I was doing the other day, because it's a bigger data set. Um, I'll get something out in a minute. And there's a lot of ways to look at models from Python. I'm going to switch over to Flow because it has fancier graphics that I know how to use off the top of my head. I know you can get them out of Python too. We'll do it this way. Okay, here's a model. Okay, so a couple things. I'm looking at uh, deviance. I'm looking at the residual error because I'm doing a regression problem. So it's not classification. I don't get an AUC. I don't get an ROC curve. Um, instead, I'm seeing basically the mean squared error over time. And it's clearly diminishing as I add trees. So the tree counts running across the bottom. Looks like I can keep adding trees and keep getting better and better. Um, maybe I want to add a lot more trees and I might get a much better answer. Um, also, the variable importances show up that it mostly matters uh, what station you, you are at as to whether you're more or less common to come and go. It makes a lot of sense. Some of the stations are located in places that are popular and some are not. And then the day count, which we might not puzzle on for a while, so what the day count means, but that seems to be uh, fairly well predictive, and the other things are not so interesting. Okay, so let's, let's, let's switch over here. Okay, so I'm seeing this nice drop in error as I add more trees. So, you know, maybe if I keep adding trees, I'll get less error. Maybe I can push the error down to zero. Maybe zero error isn't realistic. What's going on? I'm memorizing data, so I'm overfitting. Okay, so, so I, have to, I have to defend against overfitting, and that is the thing you have to do every time, because otherwise you will just overfit and not ever realize it, and you end up fooling yourself. The classic way you defend against that is you do a test train split. You want to split out uh, two-thirds, one-third. I'm doing a 70-30 split here. Um, on that order of magnitude is fine. And you're going to train on that subset, and when you train, you can't let the training algorithm see the test data to train on, or else it will memorize the test data. And when you run the test data through, you'll get perfect numbers, and you'll think you'll have a great model when, in fact, maybe you don't. So, um, so you, you build the model on the training data, and then you run the test data through and see if you get a good answer or not. And then we'll do that here real quick. Da, da, da. And here I'm going to split on the first 70% of the days and uh, uh, build my test on the, on the remaining 70 set. And you know, H2O has a validation frame as a way to uh, put your test data set in, and all the, the machine learning platforms will have something similar. There's some way to split the data conveniently. Here I ran a, a little Python program that said if your day was less than, if your day was greater than, that's how I split into 730 split. Yeah? Uh, shouldn't you like randomly split instead of doing that? Oh, okay, I don't know how many people here are aware of that, but let's look exactly at this, this year, you're one slide ahead of me. Okay, so, uh, oops, yeah, I was gonna show the flow side here. Let's go you're, you're off me here. Outline models. Here's model number two. Okay, what do I get for an answer? So the orange stuff is my validation set. It's like not nearly improving as much as the other one. So what's going on here? I, I, it looks like I have a really crappy model that's overfitting furiously. And then exactly what this fellow said, um, I split based on date. Is there a time component to my data? Is the data shifting over the months and the years? Yeah, almost surely yes. City bikes growing in popularity. There are more people in the last few months than there are in the beginning years, right? So, so the count and the numbers are just wrong. Furthermore, I took a year and a half worth of data and I trimmed off the last, you know, 30%. That didn't have a winter in it, and the first year did. Okay, so, so that winter was probably times when bikes were not so popular. 
Whereas the next spring, they're probably very popular. So, so uh, you know, picking a time-based split is is uh, is very wrong. It, it, it will frequently lead to issues with your um, real test string split. And it is common that you get data that is time sorted and broken out in files. So it's really easy to grab some set of files to do your training on and then test on some other different set of files. And you'll suddenly discover that there is a time correlation between these files and you're screwed. So you just, it's like you don't trust data that's been handed to you in separate files, but it's usually captured that way. So the original data that I brought in from the beginning here, let's go take a look at that. I, I brought in this set here. These are by the month. So I went to this website on City Bike and got this data by the month. So it is already broken up for me by time, convenient by month. And if I train on the first 10 files and test them the last three, then I'm, I'm just like screwing myself over. So I don't want to do that. I want to do, a, I want to do an actual random split. So let's go and do a random split here. So we'll try again. Here the random split is going to be based on um, runoff, which is random uniform. Give me a column of random uniform values, one per row, then split 70 or above 70% accordingly, and build another model. And now let's go back here and uh, look again. Model number three, take a look. Okay, now it looks like I'm getting something. So, so I, I'm, I'm still improving as I add more trees, but it's getting very slow. But I'm not really overfitting very much yet. So, so the first split was just wrong. It was just like crap. And this is a standard thing to like debugging your data problem. You'll get interesting numbers out. Sanity check it. If you can't figure out why it's that way, then there's probably something wrong. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like what's going on at a higher level? So when you load up Python or R or whatever, and then yeah. you have H2 on your system as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are you sort of sending data to yeah. HTML okay. and it's going to use commands that you do recognize? Or does it play with your normal syntax? So what's going on? Right, okay. So so um, that was that was another talk, but I'll, I'll talk it through right now because people will be messing here. So HTML has a built-in web server. And it takes a bunch of commands that related to doing data science through the web server. And they're all well documented. And they're loading a file, uh, splits, running the models, things like that. One of the things it also takes is essentially uh, a Lisp syntax for doing algebraic expressions on the data, including as a full feature, you know, first class functions, so you can apply lambda functions on the data and have it do whatever crappy game you want to play on every row thing. So that's how we do array broadening operators. The R and the Python, um, you load those packages and they give you an object in either R or Python, which is an h 2 data frame object, like an R data frame, and it, and it has function calls on it, including all the operator overloading that you'd expect, that make calls back to the back end where what you wrote got compiled down to a list of expression sent over the wire and executed in the cluster. So it's all on my laptop right now, and that kind of process jumping doesn't make a whole lot of difference. We're going to play with clusters here at some point, and you're going to be sitting on your laptop and talking to a, an Amazon cloud. And you're going to type something, and some list expression is going to run, and some 4 or 8 node cluster holding a terabyte of RAM is going to run that expression over there. So you're one step removed from what's going on in Python. If you load a data set local in Python, you do local things in Python, they're all in Python doing what you expect out of Python. Same syntax, pretty close, well then can be used to load an h data set, and it's just a key in the Python side pointing to the cluster, and you write an expression and it gets piled down to some you know, lispy looking format, shipped over the wire as a rest command, comes back with a JSON response, gets peeled out and handed back to you. So there is this, this back and forth going between the two. OK. I have a question Yeah. about uh, model number two. You yeah. said that you, just looking at the graph, you know exactly that it's overfitting. But yeah. I thought overfitting occurs when the validation set like, kind of curves back up. Um, could, I mean, just by looking at this, I could just say, oh, that's, that's reasonable -ish. It, it, It's reasonable-ish. So here, here's the deal. You're hugely far off in your training from your validation set. So I would expect them to track pretty closely until they start to drift apart. And oh, when they're drifting, okay. you're making progress in the training and you're not making the same progress on the validation. Probably the validation flattens. Maybe it goes back up after I go a long time, but once it's flattened, there's no point in keep pushing on here, right? I've hit you know, diminishing returns. Here, they're immediately far apart and they okay. stay far apart the whole time. That tells me there's something broken. Okay. I did a bad split. That's what I did, but right. but that that's a red flag that something's broken. They should be close until they begin to drift apart. Okay. Okay. All right, we did model number two. Okay, 
So, so we're going to go on to doing something a little better with models here. So I claim that model three was reasonable. And I might be able to make it get a better answer by piling on more trees in the end, more execution time. Um, and, and maybe you know, this is hyperparameter tuning. And so there is a, a way to, you know, you, you do do some hyperparameter tuning to get your models better, but it definitely hits the point of diminishing returns. So I want to go try out some other stuff and then play with hyperparameters in a way that I can do sort of mechanically on the fly, and then it's time to do something different. So first I want to get what I got into a scriptable, repeatable, robust workflow. So I'm going to write a little script here, and I'm going to step you through it because it's really small. And this is my, exactly what I just did for GBM here. I made a function in Python. It's going to do a split on the data set based on the 7030 split. It's going to print out something about how many it found and this or that. It's going to do the name breakout. And then it's going to run gradient boosted method. Here I'm going to run 400 trees because I did some uh, you know, hyperparameter tuning uh, you know, before I came to glass. Um, and then I'll get a runtime out of that. Then I'm going to run the same thing with the DRF, which is distributed random forest. It's random forest. Different algorithm. And then I run generalized linear modeling. And then I run deep learning. All with essentially the same workflow with sort of essentially reasonable default parameters. And then I'll print out something in the end, a little tiny table that's going to have the training valid, uh, uh, the training R squared and the validation R squared numbers plus some running time so I can see what I'm, I'm uh, getting here. Let's see. Ta -da. So Python got taught about the function, and now I'm going to run it for the first time, and something happens and it takes off. Okay, this is going to take a minute, obviously, and this is what I'm talking about, where there's a point of diminishing returns you'll have to, you'll have to figure out on. Um, uh, it's going to be like two or three minutes. If I take any other questions here, I've got a couple of minutes, like two or three. Yeah. Um, if I'm using H2O, does it make a copy of my data set? H2O is like a big calculator that copies in RAM only. When you turn it off, it's gone. Okay. So it's quick to start, it's fairly quick to load, but it's not a persistence kind of thing. Um, and then in fact, if you make a mistake and you think you got things screwed up, um, you know, it's probably reasonable to just kill it, kill minus nine, blow it all down, start it up again. One of the reasons to have a script flow is that you'll make mistakes that break your data set in RAM without realizing it at first, and then later you're like, oh, back here I lost a bunch of data because I accidentally threw it away or whatever. And, and you get a script you can replay from scratch and it won't take too long to get back to where you're at. And it's part of sort of the development cycle here. Okay, so I see DRF's taking a lot longer. Um, and in general, that's the case. It's a slower algorithm. Um, unlike GBM, DRF is actually very hard to drive it to overfitting. Um, I think it can be done, but it's just really hard. GLM also is hard to overfit, and it also runs really fast because it's already done. Whereas DRF is going to take you know a minute or so. DRF, uh, GLM is like a second. On the other hand, it doesn't make such a good model either. So we'll get the deep learning model out, and we'll take a look at, at the models and see what they're doing. Okay. Does H still have uh, GPU integration? It does not, um, and that's one of the uh, you know it, it's one of the, the interesting places to you know, uh, you know sort of future work with H2O. Um, there are a number of good GPU-based deep learning uh, uh, systems out there. Theano is sort of like the, the, the first one that, to beat. Um, and then you know, deep learning for Java, and there's a number of other ones. Um, the, the deal with GPUs is they, they give you a lot more compute power, uh, uh, just raw flops, for the amount of memory involved. And if your data set fits on a GPU, which two gigs will fit on a, on a sort of a, a reasonably good sized GPU, um, then there's, you're not going to touch that with anything else. This is too fast. Um, as your data gets larger, you can't fit it on a GPU. And then you have to play games where you're only putting pieces of it on the GPU at a time and swapping bits in and out, or you're sampling again, or you know, there's other ways that you, you, you start to screw around and make something work out. Um, H2O will run on a stock machine. To get the same flop count as a GPU, you need you know eight to, to ten sort of reasonable, good-looking x86s to hit the one GPU number. On the other hand, the implementation of Java means the algorithm itself is actually very robust. Uh, it converges very rapidly, um, relative to the count of flops being used, and has a bunch of other bells and whistles that are, are you don't necessarily find on the other algorithms. So it, it, it's worth playing with at some point and seeing you know how far it goes. Um, okay, so I got something out here. 
Um, I can see uh, GBM gave me an R squared value of almost 0.9 on the test and 0.95 on the training, and it says I'm, I'm starting to overfit GP, uh, G, uh, GBM. And in about 25 seconds it did that. DRF, in about twice as much time, gave me a much worse model, but it didn't overfit. GLM gave me an even worse model and no time at all. Um, but the model is like, you know, this is 50% of my standard deviations getting explained by the model, and this is close to 90%. So it's a substantially you know, worse model. <coughs> deep learning did not make a good show here. It is common for deep learning to be able to produce a really good model given enough time. And I, I cut this one off at some point so it wasn't going to take forever. I don't know if I kept pushing on it, it's going to improve a lot. I did do 10 minutes worth of uh, deep learning at home before I put the slide together, and it wasn't actually catching up. Uh, it could be that this data set is just not appropriate for it. And that is also the case. The credit card industry likes to use random forest for building models, and they have tried some of these other ones, and it don't work so well. And so different domains, different algorithms are going to show better. Um, okay, let's come up here. I'm going to blow away all my old models. Clean out, go again. Okay, now I have uh, four new models. So here is the, the GBM which is winning. Okay, I ran out 400 trees instead of 50. And we can see that it came down some more, but it's clearly beginning to overfit. And, and the, you know, the point which it didn't get any better was somewhere around 100 trees the validation set crossed over the, the 500 deviance line and, and then kind of flattened out. So I could probably cut back the number of trees here uh, and save myself on a lot of training time. Um, GLM was the worst model. Let's take a real quick look at it. Okay, it, it converges in five iterations internally. It's really fast. It breaks out the, the, uh, the values differently. It's showing you the individual stations and how they contributed. Although the model's not so great, so maybe I don't care. But that's, you know, Railroad Avenue and K as the primary station, it probably has the most count of people, the most reliable people. Um, DRF was the more expensive, you know, kind of no-show. I uh, ran only 100 trees, so it's much slower to build. Um, it flattened out pretty quick, 30 trees, I could just be done, it's not getting any better. What the hell? Deep learning, look real quick. Okay, I claim that's pretty flat. Maybe it dipped down a little bit. Maybe I could go longer and it might get better. Maybe not. It just doesn't, it's not obviously improving um, beyond a little tiny dip there. So at this point, I've messed around with models more than I want to, and I have some obvious winners and losers and a, and a pretty, good, pretty good set. Um, and, I, and basically, I messed around with hyperparameters. And in this case, I, I fiddled with them for more than an hour. It took me a bunch of tries. Um, and, I, and I went to the models, um, stopped really improving, and I got minor overfits. So I ran all those numbers out a ways, and they weren't actually getting any better. <coughs> um, and, and then they all trained in about a minute. Um, but in general, you wind up searching a lot. And you, can, you know, doing overnight runs with great searches over hyperparameters, and there's this definite law of diminishing returns. So at some point, it's like, okay, be done. Quit doing this. Right? Spend your time elsewhere. Um, there is this build time versus quality game that you're playing. So GBM can overfit, um, whereas random force and GLM are hard to overfit, so you, you might want to pay some more time to GBM, but you better watch out for the overfit. Um, GLM is super fast, and that's a good first cut because it's so fast, but you probably can beat GLM without any trouble. Um, and then deep learning can be very slow, and if I ran it a lot longer, maybe it gets better, maybe not, I, I don't know. I did run it for like 10 minutes, like I was saying earlier, and it wasn't getting better. Okay, so maybe there's a better way to make progress here on these models. Um, and this is in general the case. Can we uh, come up with new features? So features we were using were the station in the, in the day, but you know, average trip duration and average gender and, and things like that. What makes sense for riding bikes? What, what's a good predictive thing for riding a bike? So I'll claim it's weather. You know, it's 20 below and sleeting, are you going to ride a bike? It's a time to call Uber, right? And what the hell, right? Maybe it's a you know sunny day in June, and, and it's a great day for holidays. So you're out on your bike cruising around. Well, so let's add some other features, right? So I'm going to step right into it, and I'll come back around, and we'll we'll summarize what's going on here. Let me go find it. Okay, so here's some other data. I picked these files out, they're on that disk floating around. 
Um, actually, let me go with the summary here. Same game, load the data, parse, ooh, okay, same as before, it scrolls on and on and on, what happened? Okay, wait, oh, here's some, here's some titles. Year local, month local, day local, hour local, okay, there's a time there. There's some broken out, column by column, there's a time field. Uh, UTC, probably universal time, what is UTC? Is it gonna be Greenwich Mean Time? I, I, you know, I have to go hunt up what that means. But I'll, I'll, I'll trust local time, meaning New York time, how about that? Okay, CAVOC reported, I have no idea. Cloud ceiling, cloud cover fraction, that looks good. If I keep hunting around in there, I can find things like dew point and humidity. Well, maybe it sucks to be out riding your bike if it's a super hot, humid day. Precipitation one hour, that sounds like rain. There's weather codes. Okay, there's something there that makes some sense, but let's like trim this down to something reasonable to look at. So I'm gonna grab columns that I recognize that I can see are not all uh, empty. Many of the columns are in fact all empty. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the time columns because we're gonna have to merge the data based on the time, based on the day. And I'm going to keep rain and rename it rain. I'm going to rename weather code one slash description of weather code so I get something that's like easier to look at. Okay, oh, we just barely don't fit, darn it. Uh, never, I have no idea how big the resolution is going to be when I get here. So I get year, month, day, hour, came through. Here's year 2013, 2014, 2013. Here's month, the months are running from one to 12. It's graphs, it's hard to read. So it's a one base month number, that's pretty common. One to 31 for days, is one base day. Zero to 22 for hours, okay, this is weather by hour. And it's zero based on the hour, that's fine. There's some dew points in Celsius. There's some humidity fraction from a low of 0.12 to a high of one. That sounds like a really sweaty day if you're riding a bike. There's some rain numbers. Um, I can't hardly see the rain numbers. Let me see if I can short this up some more and get the rain out of it. I can't type, that's what I did. Weather 2, and I called it rain, or rain and 2. Yeah, wow, that was very exciting. A lot of nants. Okay, here we go. Oh, it says I have a zero millimeters some days, up to 27 millimeters. Boy, rain cats and dogs, I guess. Oh, 15,000 missing things in rain. Um, out of 17,000. Okay, is that useful? I don't know. Does it mean it's missing? Or does it mean it didn't rain that day? This is one of the things where you have to like start puzzling it out yourself. So, um, the data set's more reasonable, but I'm gonna filter down to the noon hour, because there's a lot of hours in a day, and I'm gonna pretend that people aren't riding their bike at 2 a.m. So filter down, keeping only in weather three, only those things that match the noon hour. Also, I'm now gonna do a time hack. I'm gonna take the year, month, and day local, um, and do a make time, which is a standard Unix utility, shows up in C, shows up in R and Python as well, um, to go compute the, the, the time since milliseconds since the epic. Next line down, convert that to day since the epic, and that's my join column. That's how I'm gonna line up the data sets. They're gonna match on the day since the, the Unix epic. Look again, okay, a bunch of columns roll off, but I can see milliseconds as 1.3, the e to the 12th, and, and days, and here the day is marching along. So one time, one time slot at noon was kept, and one unique per day. So that's my sanity check that I've got something reasonable here. Okay, drop all those extra time fields, take the rain, and is an A means if it's missing, replace it with a zero. Okay, did all that. Now do the merge. Okay, the merge is gonna take the two data sets, which is bikes per day, BPD, and weather four, and line them up on the columns that match, which is the day column. Okay, and then we'll do uh, a, a summary after that. Take a look. Okay, <coughs> here's my columns now. It's the days that I lined up with and the station just like I had before. And then there's the mean, trip duration, birth, bikes, Gender, oh, I have humidity fraction, rain, temperature, weather code, dew point. I have more information on every row. So per station per day on that day includes the trip count of the bikes and the weather on that day. I have more information I can go predict with. And because I have this, sorry, we'll, we'll take a look here. Okay. 
Okay, so a lot of stuff happened here. Um, most of the columns in that data set were junk. I, I, I shortcut it for you, but I stared at them all at one point in the past, and mm, two-thirds of them were all missing values. But there was some meat in there that I capped. Then I approximated the whole day by just taking the noon hour. But I might have done better if I had joined on, the, on the, the hour of the bike ride against the weather at that hour. Maybe that would help, I don't know. It was another, you know, I, I could improve my data science here and get a better answer, maybe. Um, I had to hack another variant of time. And that's really common. You'll see different variants of time all over the place. And you'll have to make guesses. Is it local time? Is it Greenwich Mean Time? Is it UTC? Is it, you know, daylight savings time or standard time? Is it whatever the hell? It's going to vary all over the map. Off by one on the month and the day because it's zero based time for the Unix month and day and one based on the status set. Rain, I just made a guess. Missing value meant zero rain. Did my join. And then I'm going to rerun. So now would you export that so that you had it later in case something happens? Or okay, so. Would you just leave it in the. Right, so. so the, the game here is what is the cost to munge the data versus saving to disk and reloading it? Turns out that disk I.O. is the losing factor by generally a lot. So for simple munging like I'm doing, I'd rather have a script and rerun from scratch. Take the original data, reapply all the transformations, know that I can repeat that process, because it will be the case that you'll be messing with your fingers on the keyboard, and you'll do some stuff, do some stuff and you'll get a great model out. What did you do? You'll scroll back through your history and grab some stuff, but you'll miss some of the things, and you'll do some, and you'll recognize, oh, I didn't need to do this piece or that, and so you'll leave them out of the script or whatever, you'll get it wrong. So it, it's really important to, at some point, stop, make a script, and repeat what you're doing with that script until that script gets it right every time, and then you can use the script to drive going forward. You want the interactive thing, you want to sit down at your, at your Python console and go to town, but to replay it, you better have a script behind your back because you're not going to replay it from memory from scratch every time. And then that, in turn, means that you can blow the cluster down, restart it, and get to the same spot again by just rewriting that script. So for the data munging, it's usually pretty quick. The model builds take longer, but if you can't replay how you get a model, it's like, it's like doing a science experiment which you can't repeat, right? It's not actually science until you can rerun it. Okay, so one other thing to look here is that DRF's taking a lot longer. We're all like, quiet, what the hell's going on? Turns out DRF has a big uh, component based on the width of the columns. And, and uh, uh, it's linear, and I, and I doubled the column count, so it's going to take twice as long. Whereas TLM has this cubic thing, but we're so far down into the noise that going from 10 columns to 20 was still, I didn't care. But if I went from 1,000 columns to 2,000 columns, I'd notice it. Deep learning will be a lot longer too. Um, not hugely more. So deep learning does a lot of games where the 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 runtime is sort of normalized to a bunch of other things, and you get less training instead. So we won't necessarily get the better model out despite adding more features because. Some of these algorithms need more runtime to explore a larger data set. DRF will explore that larger data set and take twice as long doing it. Deep learning will not explore it so much. He'll explore all of it, but with less depth because we didn't let him run long enough. And I gave him that way because I pinned his, his iteration count to a low, fast number so I could do it in class. But if I was to, to try again with deep learning, taking another 10 or 20 minutes might actually have him produce a really good answer. Okay. So some things to look at here. I got about 90% out of GBM. It didn't like actually help. But DRF caught up. It's like 87%. It's like really close. It had been well below that before. So it jumped a bunch. GLM was at 0.5 and change. Went to 0.7. Right away it got a lot better. And that says that looks to me like weather has a nice linear correlation to whether or not you're going to ride a bike. So let's go look at the models a little more graphically. And I'm going to take the, let's look at uh, GLM first. 
So this is the, the, the big winner. Okay, so again, it converges super fast. Oh, you can't, oh, here we go. I'm gonna look at the, so here's the leading coefficients, and he breaks them all out, which is really helpful. Uh, this is a different discussion on GLM. So GLM has the useful property that the model is very interpretable. You can understand what it means. In this case, the magnitude of the coefficients drive you toward your answer more or more or less strongly. A larger magnitude coefficient is more uh, uh, drives to the answer more directly, and the smaller ones don't change it so much. I'm going to break out all the coefficients because here they're alpha sorted, and I can whip down to the bottom, get past all the station names, 340, on and on and on and on and on and on, the scroll bar. Ah, oh, wait down at the bottom on here. Okay, so if I look at things like days, there's a small negative correlation. Um, whatever it means, it means that days were actually fine, kind of modest. But if I look at temperature, that 0.4 number is actually larger than many of the station numbers, if I scroll up and down here, or at least on the same order of magnitude. Hot or cold matters. As not nearly as much as rain. New Yorkers don't mind riding a bike in the rain. Okay. Sorry, Cliff, what are those numbers correspond to? Those numbers are how GLM defines a model. Uh, people know what a, a, a generalized linear model looks like, what a linear model looks like? It's, it's going to be your predictor value times a coefficient plus predictor times coefficient plus times coefficient and so on. I have 350 coefficients, 340 stations plus date, time, weather, da da da. And so I have 350 coefficients and you multiply them by, you know, all of their predictor values and add them up and that's your answer. So those are the coefficients? Those are the coefficients. Okay. Bigger coefficients drive that answer up and down faster. Yeah? Are, is the importance, um, I guess, metric correlated with like the confidence interval you have for that particular coefficient? There, this, this one, I didn't do confidence intervals on those coefficients. No, it's it's the actual magnitude. magnitude. Oh. Right. So for stations broken out that are, it's true or false per station. If you left at whatever in K Street, the most primary one, then there was a strong correlation that that event happened um, because that station is more popular. So there was something about the number of people that came out of the station. If you were on that station, it's a greater number. Okay. okay. How, how can you compare the coefficients in the GLM? Really With each other? Standardized, right? the, what I was showing you was the standardized coefficients. You can get them both standardized and non-standardized. They're, they're in the same output. So down here, this is all, all the different uh, machine learning tools will turn out things at different, uh, turn out most of these numbers anyhow. So here's the coefficients and here's the standardized coefficients. So both of them. I'm sure you said this already, but what are we asking the GLM to predict? The number of riders leaving a station. In that day. On that day. And, and that, by the way, points out an interesting problem if, you, if you're not paying attention, it's easy to get confused as to what exact thing you're trying to predict and end up building a model predicting something nearby but not what you're trying to predict. Um, okay, let's look at GBM, which is sort of the winner. Um, again, we see some modest overfitting around tree 100. Um, here, the stations are all run together for variable importance and, and that remains the most important thing, but actually temperature has a strong component. And day has a lesser component. And my, my guess on day is that's the, that's the average trend of city bike over time. More bikes later in life. So if your day number is larger, there are more bikes because it's got to ramp up in popularity. And uh, here's the deep learning model. Okay, so it's like messing around. I'm not quite clear yet what it's doing. I might want more iterations here. And so that was my guess earlier that it, it, I shorted it because it needs more time because I doubled the data set. I didn't get more time. So maybe there's more progress to be had. It's kind of screwing around. It was still dropping and then it like had a little dip up. I wonder if it wouldn't get back and let it go a little bit, might get somewhere. How much control do you have over the structure for deep learning? Like can you use different activation functions? Yes, totally. And I totally picked uh, sort of a default standard goodness and but I didn't play with any of that stuff. The, the, the deep learning guy has got some 60 or 70 parameter knobs to tune, some of which it makes sense to tune manually without being an expert, some of which you pretty much better know what you're doing or you'll just get random junk. Um, defining the neuron layer and how big and how deep it is one that's kind of reasonable for people to tune. Bigger neuron layers will definitely you know, slow you down 
and deeper ones will pick up structure if there's structure to be found. But they'll cost you in runtime. But if there's no structure to be found, it, it won't make any difference. Okay. Let's try the other one. How about that one? Okay, so um, so maybe I get a better model out of more features. You know, clearly GLM got really better, but maybe I need to retune my hyperparameters. And and that's sort of a general trend too. Like, don't burn days on hyperparameter search tuning until you've messed with some features as well. And and it's it's you know it's pay attention to where your time's going as to what you're getting out of it. Um, it is nice that DRF caught up to GBM because it's a much harder to overfit model. So you get much more robust model out of it. Um, and then the other models, some more, some less, maybe I can spend more time, especially on deep one, and get a better answer. I think GBM topped out at that 0.89 number. Kind of surprising when I thought it picked up something, but it picked up something earlier without weather that was good enough. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up here while I'm losing my voice. Um, you're coding with data. You have an edit, compile, debug cycle. You're gonna edit, you're gonna munge and hack the data. You're gonna add features, you're gonna throw away the junk ones, you're gonna sort through and look, you're gonna compile, build a model, try to predict. And then look at that, is that a sane model? What's it saying, what's it missing? What's not the right going on there? Do I need to run it longer, hyperparameter search, do I need more features? Is there something obvious I can do? And you go back around. And you circle until you're done, until it's good enough. And if you're looking for a business use case, how good that model needs to get will depend on what the business use case says. You know, some of these things where it's uh, 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 the, the cost of failure is pretty low, you're looking for a modest increase, you take it, you run, you're good. You're looking for credit card fraud, you're fighting against guys who've been doing this for 20 years, your model is going to scrape hard to go from 0.9 to 0.91, you know, accuracy. But that point, extra 0.1, it's going to save somebody a million dollars a year. Right, so it's worth it, and they'll, they'll pay to get that to happen. Um, maybe it's you know cancer, and the cost of missing a cancer is some guy doesn't get diagnosed soon enough, and then you know that's a person's life on the line. Um, and so maybe you want to push harder in some domains. It's worth more or less in different domains according to what it is. Test train split we covered pretty well. Use the random split. It's easy. It's fine. And then optimize your time on how to get a better model out. Sometimes you know. Hitting the big, do it all, try all combos button works. And sometimes you're better off using your head and thinking through how to, how to build more features in there. So we're all features, uh, domain experts on weather. That one's easy. And you know, figuring out that missing rain probably means zero rain, that's probably sane too. But maybe around some of these other things, you have to have access to a domain expert. And that should be a, a thing that you know going into that project. If you're getting hired in to go do data science somewhere, almost surely there better be a domain expert around or access to, and you should ask that question up front. Okay, who, who am I talking to with a domain expertise? And then time is just this funny game because everyone does it differently, and I don't know why, but all over the planet, people have different ways to represent time. Missing time zone info is the, wrong, is the biggest easy failure mode. Just know that you have to figure out the damn time zone. And it won't be in the data, and it won't be in the data of Providence, and you'll have to puzzle it out. Suffer, right? Okay, and then finally, you know, what's this date? 3 slash 2 slash 10. Anyone here think it's February 3rd? How about March 2nd? And he takes that, oh, somebody raise their hand. You know, no one else is going to raise no their gas? Even? Come on. No? Well, the answer, of course, is whether you're Euro or USA, because they flip those by default. So where'd your data set come from? Did you get your data set collected in Europe and you download it over the web? Hey, it's the African rain challenge from Kegel. I got this data set, it's got some times. What are those numbers? They're probably Euro time. Maybe it was in South America, South Africa, the country, which is you know based off like English, uh, not French. And maybe it's the other way around. So, so better ask that question, right? Know that it's there. But time is very, very useful because many, many data sets have time. And it's a great way to add more features into a data set. Time and geodata, like zip codes and stuff. You get all kinds of uh, cool data off of you know, different zip codes, people's average salaries and incomes and education levels and stuff that you can apply to data sets where people are involved and, and find out a bunch more stuff about, uh, about stuff. Okay. Um, Next time around, I want to ask people to get serious about uh, uh, running H2O and doing some data science. You notice that, that way back in the slides, I said, hey, let's do weekday versus weekend on the bike trip. I didn't actually do it. 
I ran out of time and I thought I'd actually leave it for the homework challenge. So your homework challenge, I'll see if anyone does this, is to go load that data set in, figure out how to hack the, the, the script there to get uh, a weekday versus weekend as a predictive feature. And then see if that helps the model. And then sort yourselves into groups. Wouldn't that have the same effect as just the model using day, but... So that would be assuming that the modeling technology can do a mod 7 function in its learning parameters. Right? Okay, and that's actually not commonly going to happen. So you're going to do the mod 7 for it. Right? You might also throw in holidays. Hey, it's New York City on Christmas, on 4th of July. How many bikes are ridden on 4th of July? Well, I bet quite a lot. You want to go to the subway, it's smashed to pieces. Maybe you want to get out of there on your bike. You're sure not going to drive in a car on 4th of July, right? So, so you know, there's some things you can throw in that might make sense for helping predict the quality. Of it. And that is it, because, you know, yeah. Yeah. Will you be able to post some of the code? Yeah, so I should have put the code on the stick and I did not. So I'll get the code on the website for people. And I'd like my stick back. And let's see who, how far it got. Who's got the stick? You have to say, who has not grabbed from the stick and wants to? Okay, go, go visit this guy or go visit somebody in the class who's got a, a, a different stick and we can play the Fibonacci expansion on, you know, I, I told my two neighbors.